Thank you all for joining us. Our webinar will start momentarily. If you have any questions, please submit them into the Q&A tool. And Barnaby, are you ready to get started? Uh, yeah, sure am. Are we, are we ready to go? Yes, we are. Thank you for joining us. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Um, I'm Barnaby Page. And today we're going to be talking about um, IoT infrastructures and the ecosystem. And we are very fortunate to have two um, really excellent speakers. Um, we have Rob Bathurst, who's our worldwide managing director for healthcare and embedded systems. Um, Rob uh, came to Silence from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and prior to that, he was working at the Department of Energy. So he has very deep technical expertise an understanding of architectures and how all these devices work together, um, not just in healthcare, but also in automotive. Um, and we also have, uh, talking with Rob, we have Amy Musharwa, who's a partner at uh, Davis Wright Tremaine. Uh, she's also the cybersecurity practice leader uh, at DWT. Um, Amy has over 20 years of experience in technology and law. And uh, it's, I can tell you, it's just a pleasure to work with uh, both of these people. Um, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to have them and they have deep technical and legal expertise. And um, they're going to talk about IoT and, and how it's used in both business and consumer settings and you know, the many challenges that are raised uh, by these emerging architectures. So um, I'm going to hand this off to Rob to start and talk about our IoT ecosystem. Yeah, thank you very much, Barnaby. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so the agenda we're going to cover uh, today is going to be kind of the value potential and uh, how different businesses and organizations deal with IoT, uh, how they use that, how it can impact them, how it can uh, affect their internal and external uh, exposures. Uh, we'll cover some legal and regulatory compliance, uh, mostly on, on Amy's side, that, you know, how that matters, why that matters, both from a practitioner standpoint and from uh, the standpoint of those who manufacture devices. And then <clears throat> we'll cover some of the uh, outcomes uh, of those legislations and uh, that legislative effort. And then the practical design checklists of what matters uh, to those who use IoT and those who manufacture IoT. So next slide, please. So what we run into a lot of times uh, here at Silence uh, when we do consulting for both the manufacturer OEM side of the business and those who uh, actually utilize a lot of these IoT technologies is the value in the, the business drivers uh, often inform the design of these devices. Uh, sometimes they are singular fixed function devices, uh, something in the case of like a sensor in a, a medical setting that could be something that is just checking your blood pressure remotely, uh, all the way to IoT devices that we you know, see in the automotive space, which are essentially rolling networks of networks and subsystems associated with those, each one with a specific purpose of checking tire pressure monitors to you know, driver alertness to where the vehicle's at, last maintenance state, each one uh, being measured by a, a different system. And so, what we run into uh, when we try to evaluate these is kind of threefold. One, how was the business uh, envisioned this particular IoT uh, technology deployed inside of their customer environment? What kind of data and connectivity is required for this device to perform its uh, uh, daily routines and its, its actual purpose? And then what is the impact should that device be compromised or leveraged to compromise uh, the organization it's deployed in? Um, one of the things we're especially careful of uh, when we're dealing with a, you know, a particular industries is automotive and healthcare. Uh, the two reasons why are those, those have the most personal, uh, you know, uh, most personal impact uh, to us in our daily lives. Uh, we all know whether or not our car stops working. We all know whether or not um, the machine we're attached to while we're in a clinic uh, is functioning properly because all of a sudden it starts producing weird numbers or making sounds. Um, so those have the most you know, practical uh, you know, feeling for most people. 
Um, what do you say, I mean, in terms of, you know, what's your perspective and your, your client's perspective on, you know, how they view IoT? Absolutely. I, I think there is an, an interesting trend in IoT devices to have more processing power at the endpoints and try to use endpoints not as just sensors, but um, and, you know, having processing power in trying to derive actionable information. You know, the more we decentralize information, the more difficult it is to secure. So that's just one thing that we've found. And while um, we, you know, everyone on the line has probably heard of the Mirai botnet and IoT devices being compromised for their bandwidth, what we are seeing in practical data breach situations and scenarios is that IoT devices are becoming entry points onto your networks. So, you know, as um, many of you, if you have IoT devices that are known and perhaps unknown to you, um, where that IoT device sits on your network and how it has allowed an, um, an internet connection and an entrance, um, you know, into either your guest infrastructure or your corporate infrastructure is as important as the design choices and, and kind of how that device has been vetted. Um, one interesting piece, since we chatted a tiny bit about the, the um, hospital setting, is, you know, as we're trying to think of the broader view of IoT devices as potential entry points onto your network, your average hospital room has 15 to 20 IoT devices in one hospital room alone for patient monitoring. And some of those devices are wired. Some of those devices are wireless. So as we are thinking through, um, you know, thinking through security, we're thinking through, you know, both points of connectivity. Um, but really, you know, for, for a number of, of companies and covered entities, we're looking at a massive, you know, a massive uptick in the amount of internet nodes that have to be monitored and, and determined whether or not they're secure, in addition to the traditional internet nodes of systems and devices and appliances that, that we're used to maintaining security of. Yeah, and that's, that's a great point. Um, not just the you know, 15 to 20 devices in a patient room, but a lot of healthcare organizations are also putting patient, uh, the patients with systems. So they may be carrying around mobile monitoring systems. They may have full sensors. They might have other things that are connected to the roaming Wi-Fi throughout a medical campus um, that we also have to be concerned with. Uh, because if that patient goes home, if that patient goes to get something to eat outside the campus while that device is still on them and then comes back into your network, uh, it needs to you know, have a, a certain amount of protection and scrutiny applied to it as well. Um, while it's while it's out there, and then then once it returns, um, that's that's a absolutely. And well, and many of the telehealth devices, um, you know, as we're talking about healthcare providers, are IoT devices. You know, so the full patient interaction um, goes through the the, the tele the telehealth endpoints. So there's many applications within healthcare, outside of healthcare, and a significant amount of sensitive data that these devices are tracking and, and processing and even generating. So we, we have to make sure that um, we're doing a diligent job of design security and architectural security. Um, and we can flip on to the next slide and start to talk about regulation. So, the interesting thing that we have seen is, is Senate Bill 327 and the California IoT law. Before I start talking about that law, I think it is much more important to say before California even specifically decided to look at IoT security, there's an awful lot of existing law that applies to Internet of Things devices. So, for example, the Federal Trade Commission, under its Section 5 authority for unfair and deceptive marketing practices, regulates 
reasonable security. And the Federal Trade Commission has an IoT design white paper that outlines what it defines as reasonable security. And we would encourage everyone on the line to look at that. Um, also, sector specific privacy laws, you know, such as, as HIPAA and others, do regulate information and information security. Um, specifically for HIPAA, it regulates the secure passage, maintenance, and reception of, of PHI or personal health information. So to the extent that you have, that you're in a sector specific industry that has a security law, such as HIPAA or Graham Leach Bliley, you know, you are going to be following that primary sector specific federal law. And we are always going to be following to the extent that you're regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, it's reasonable security guidance. Um, California has just decided to step into the fray with its power as a state regulator. Um, so what does this new Senate Bill 327 actually do? Um, it is the first internet security law in the US, although we, we do have existing law that would apply. IoT device manufacturers must equip the device with reasonable security features. They must prevent unauthorized access, destruction, modification, or information disclosure. It's important to blow this out a little bit. Um, the reasonable security features must be, one, appropriate to the device, two, appropriate to the information collected, three, designed to protect the device and any info from unauthorized access, destruction, use, modification, or deletion. And, and then this law, you can have a pre-programmed password for a device, but it must be unique to each device, and each device um, must have a new means of authentication if the device is used for the first time, which that's important because you have to design that into the, the product refresh process. What I find interesting about Senate Bill 327 is it regulates design security. Um, whereas the sector specific laws, HIPAA, GLBA, that have reasonable security components, are looking at not just design, but design might be a component of perhaps for some of you on the line who rely on third party service providers for your IoT devices. You might not have control over that and you might just be vetting the work of others. But when you are setting a device inside your network and it is your responsibility to, to deploy that device, you know, if that is a part of, of your deployment contract, um, you know, then under your existing sector specific laws, you not only have the responsibility or, you know, to vet the design security, you also have the responsibility for the architectural security. So, so very, very important not to think that California is the only is the only statute in the game or statute that would be applicable to security for IoT devices. And the California statute specifically excludes where um, that it does not address where there is existing federal regulation such as HIPAA and GLBA and others. Um, it is also really helpful to mention when we generally mention, you know, what is reasonable security, um, there are discernible components to what is reasonable security. Um, the FTC and in its IoT design white paper is an excellent source, but I'm, I'm going to rattle off the, the, the facets that I look at most acutely um, when I'm evaluating reasonable security for my clients. Um, but that is the security by design process, so kind of the setup and how a device was put together and designed itself. Um, the security culture of an organization and how through its documentation and design process did it astutely consider security or was security just a small design component but not nearly as important as the functionality. Third-party service provider vetting patching and vulnerability monitoring, including like where you are the device manufacturer and you are going to be deploying patches and product updates. 
defense in depth, which you know that is where you, the IoT device um, sits within your network, access control, and monitoring and testing of the device. So you know there's an, a number of different permutations of what constitutes reasonable security, but there's generally some areas that we can coalesce on, and we'll be talking a little bit about this more at the, at the end. But um, where we used to be able to say, you know, reasonable security is an extremely nebulous thing that no one defines, we do have good sector-specific law. We do have guidance from security standards. We do have folks that are subject to generally applicable audit standards. So there is an awful lot of um, existing law and existing standards that even as a company, if you are, you know, kind of not keeping up with those standards, and if you, for those of you who are lawyers or compliance folks on the phone, if you're not asking those general questions and touching base with your IT regarding how they're documenting those processes, you know, once you have an issue and, uh, and you are squarely confronted with the law, that is not when you want to be examining you know, those areas and those questions. You, you should be really doing it ahead of time. Um, in addition to Senate Bill 327 that you know, it will take into effect in January of 2020, um, you know, there are other um, pieces of legislation that have been introduced in the California Senate. And, and you know, what, what we have learned in state data breach laws as well as what California does will not be outdone by other states. <laughs> so we would anticipate that other states would also start to jump in the fray with their own IoT laws soon. Um, but we have listed some other consumer, consumer level laws that have been tried to be introduced. I think what is most important though with the Senate Bill 327 is that it really broadly defines what is an IoT device. So, you know, to any device that connects to the internet through through the internet or even through Bluetooth, you know, such that when you are, you know, you know, for our compliance and security folks on the phone, when you're inventorying what constitutes IoT, you're really going to have to under this this um, under this law cast your net extremely broadly. If we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, and just, just to you know, follow in there, one of the things we recommend to a lot of our clients um, in terms of good reference material on either designing or determining whether or not the system you're using has been designed in a secure and efficient manner, um, there is NIST 800-160V1, uh, I believe, which is their um, yep your engineering recommendations. And so even if you're not a manufacturer of those devices, uh, it is a, a, a good piece of reference material. Uh, and then the other part I would say about uh, legislation, especially from the general cybersecurity community that isn't focused on, on the legal aspect is that there are you know two schools of thought, right? So Bruce Schneier and, and Robert Graham particularly talking about this, which is, you know, why put out legislation that isn't addressing what we consider to be the future, uh, whereas uh, a lot of the other school of thought is, well, why wait to put out something that, you know, is good enough for now? Uh, and so what we in the cybersecurity community have to do when we really evaluate how we build these IoT devices and how we secure them and how they get placed into our environments is determine if the technology that was put into the IoT device was additive as a design requirement, meaning firewalls and AVs and you know routing and protecting you know the microkernel and all these other technologies that get it added after the fact, or if the way the device was designed was a subtractive process, meaning we took a base design and we took out all the unneeded Linux or Windows processes that shouldn't have been there. Um, understanding how the concept uh, of the device from a design perspective was put together uh, will really help you as a security practitioner 
understand where vulnerabilities may be. Uh, the other big thing a lot uh, uh, of these laws and guidance, especially when it comes to the FDA post-market guidance, uh, they say that devices have to have the capability to be updated or should have the capability to be updated. Now, that doesn't spell out exactly what the update mechanism is or what the reasonable timing of an update is mm -hmm. or, or how it does. And so one of the other things we have to be aware of is one of the large botnet attacks leveraged an update mechanism, an auto update mechanism. And so just because it's in place doesn't mean it's a, a security feature. If you don't understand the way it's designed, it can actually become a point of exposure, um, which is to this slide, which uh, you know, I'll let Amy start talking about, that UL standard was meant to address in some depth um, what secure design was and, and how you, you document that. Absolutely. But I, I think that that is um, security context. Like as we're talking to clients is, is the most important thing because if you are looking at an audit standard and an illegal requirement, you know, oftentimes it is divorced from, you know, the specific context of your IoT device, the architecture of your network. And I can't tell you how many times, at least on the PCI DSS standards, for example, um, the specific standards don't do a good job of, of being flexible enough to be meaningful for um, every, com every um, network appliance and issue to which it is subject. So you know, as, as you're evaluating specifically your IoT devices and you're inventorying, okay, what, what laws are we subject to? Are we subject to sector-specific privacy and data security laws? Are we subject to and do, or do clients require us to abide by contractual and or audit standards that may apply to our IoT devices? And last but not least, are we in the general bucket of regulation of the FTC or other state AGs that might subject us to another kind of layer of reasonable security in addition to the layers that we are already dealing with? Oftentimes, our clients are faced with not just one set of standards and set of applicable law, but it is layers of standards, applicable laws, and audits that they're doing. And it's trying to find out the appropriate security context for your devices and really your security efforts in general um, and how you generate evidence for those activities, you know, kind of throughout those audit life cycles and how you do that consistently. So in that, that is, you know, for, for our team, you know, the, the largest problem that most, lar that most very large enterprise organizations face is that they're doing an awful lot with regard to security. It's just the context can change and vary greatly. And quite often, the standards to which they're subject might not be easily applicable or directly translatable to their IoT devices and networks. Um, but specifically for the, the UL standard, and I'm gonna talk generally about it and then let Rob talk about the process. Um, you know, the UL standard is relatively new. It's just a few years old. Um, historically, though, you, you know, the, the UL laboratories, um, they developed a certification standard for RF, for radio frequency emissions. Seeing that cybersecurity and that they were already reviewing an awful lot of devices, they developed this standard to, to you know, fill a spot in the marketplace. There are also others that will certify devices for you. But to try to develop something that would be directly applicable to cybersecurity of IoT, um, you know, seeing that there's not a significant amount of, of generally applicable security standards that specifically address IoT. Um, you know, one, because this process is so new and because many of you are often relying upon the UL certification or the UL alignment process, and we'll talk about that in a moment, 
um, that has been done by a third party and not by your organization. You know, it's oftentimes really difficult to um, determine what the utility of this process is. So let me let Rob kind of explain the process and then we'll talk about the utility of it and we'll talk about kind of how, how, is, how is a company normally as not as an insider in this process unless you manufacture devices, how are you supposed to obtain good evidence and artifacts that an IoT device you're allowing on your network is indeed secure? Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that. So one of the things we do as an organization here at Silence on the consulting side is help organizations deal with aligning to a particular standard. You know, typically we see it in the, the 853, we see it in a lot of you know, HIPAA or, you know, technical controls related to specific industries or, or sub, uh, you know, sub industries or sub uh, uh, categories. And so one of the things that's interesting about UL is UL was um, made in a, a, a create a creative research and development agreement with the VA to create a baseline of cybersecurity for medical devices. Um, the good and the bad about that is it no longer means that you have to trust the word of a, uh, a third party, such as the device manufacturer themselves, to say they're secure. It uh, doesn't mean that you have to go to an outside security organization like us or many others to determine whether or not they followed some kind of standard and provide an attestation because UL makes their standard publicly available for a nominal fee. Um, what the complication becomes is that UL is not a requirement. It is a, it, unlike the UL certification or CE certification for things like electrical insulation and a lot of other industries that say you must have an independent certified testing laboratory evaluate the um, efficacy of what you've put in place. Uh, cybersecurity is very hard to do that with. And so even UL struggles with determining what the artifacts that they require as part of the process um, and, and how they matter and why they matter. Ultimately, for you to get the UL certification uh, mark, you have to go through the UL certification assistance program, I think is what they call it, uh, where they take a bunch of individual data points, everything from network flow to design architecture to business objectives to um, what your mitigations are, what your reasonable risk evaluation is of a product, um, what your user schemas might look like, what your last vulnerability analysis produced, whether or not you, you track those things. And it's all centered around the cybersecurity of a particular device on a particular OS um, manufactured at a point in time. Um, one of the weaknesses uh, of the, the current design of, of UL, which I'm sure they'll address for future standards, is that it's, it's not good for OSs and systems that rapidly uh, innovate because the UL standard uh, that they apply in the process they go through when they do their evaluation uh, can take us a, a significant amount of time, months, which can delay a release cycle. So what we find a lot of our customers doing for devices that have a fairly frequent update cycle or that they don't necessarily want to spend, you know, hundreds or, you know, tens of thousands of dollars uh, running through a certification once for a particular product is we spend a lot of time uh, aligning their internal uh, organization to be able to produce the artifacts and documentation that something like UL uh, would require should they choose to go through it. And when you look at something like what UL requires versus something like what NIST 800-160 says as best practices and guidance for secure engineering, the outcome is, is generally very closely aligned. Uh, what mm -hmm. a lot what a lot of our uh, clients have difficulty in, and, and the reason they bring us in a lot, is to you know, help address that, uh, as we pointed out from the legal perspective, what's, what's reasonable, what, what it would be considered satisfactory. Um, one of the things UL does not do as part of the standard is like, here's an exemplar of 
what we expect to see from a network flow diagram so that we can certify that you know what you're doing. You're expected to produce a bundle of artifacts that they can evaluate whether or not it meets the requirement that they've outlined in the standard. And so through that process, what we end up doing, both intentionally and unintentionally with a lot of our clients, is creating a secure engineering and development uh, lifecycle program for them uh, that by its very nature produces the artifacts that UL would require. Now, why that is interesting from a, an HDO, a health delivery organization, or an organization that manages a lot of IoT assets, it could be anything from cars to you know, uh, programmable logic controllers in the energy and oil and gas space, is that the amount of artifacts that this requires and the process that they have to go through should be readily available uh, to you as an organization to help you understand what we call residual risk, right? So they go through their evaluation process, they design it, they put out their design requirements, they architect it, they build the software, they run their you know, cybersecurity evaluations, they get the development build ready, then they do their final evaluation using a third party, hopefully, they produce a vulnerability report, they then mitigate those things and then create the release candidate that goes out the door. What's interesting there is all that history, all that documentation, all those artifacts in a good program should be kept and available to you. So when you're, uh, as a security practitioner inside an organization, uh, receiving a device or looking at buying a device and you're evaluating the cybersecurity of it, you can use some of the artifacts referenced in, in the UL standard to ask for, hey, do you have documentation of your network architecture that this should be deployed in? Do you have network flow diagrams that show me what ports and protocols your IoT device operates on? And then the big question we always ask is, what's the last vulnerability analysis that was done of this system when it was released into the general market and what residual risk, meaning what unmitigated uh, vulnerabilities are still present in the system that you've chosen to accept that I'm about to bring into my environment. Um, that's, that's a huge one because reasonably, uh, in some cases, their IoT device may have a, a risk because of its design. It's the way it was created and they may have taken a reasonable measure to mitigate that risk, but it's still there, it's still present. And depending how that device is deployed inside of your environment and how you utilize it and how you manage it from a business operations perspective, you may be adding, you know, you may be adding or subtracting to the mitigation they already put in place. And so knowing from the manufacturer to the user of that device, what the risk has been, what risk, what risk was transferred uh, is ex extremely important um, to understanding the overall uh, impact it has to your, to your network. Absolutely. And one thing that's also helpful to mention on the line, and this is outside of the UL process, but related to, um, related to device security is it's extremely helpful to have third parties and outside counsel manage this process because there's also other permutations of security that most just would not consider. And I'll give you a, a very realistic issue that I faced um, it, for um, this was not a breach, um, but it was a pen test that we had another provider do where we had an IoT device that most of these IoT devices are subject to the um, FCC registration process for, um, for RF emissions, meaning in order to get a device proved, oftentimes it must be filed before the Federal Communications Commission, along with all of its technical details. Well, our providers ended up um, getting the FCC ID registration for the device that my client had, purchasing the component parts, and then by building their own device, getting onto my client's network. <laughs> so, you know, kind of as, um, 
you know, as you're thinking of, okay, well, do we bring in a third party? Do we go through a certification process? Do we hire a lawyer? You know, don't just look at like the UL standard or a NIST-based standard or your sector-specific law and really think, well, dear, anybody can go through a punch list. What you're really looking for is do you have the expertise internally to know how sensitive is the data flowing over that device and how tactically as you mechanically go through a standard or you go through a security review, how tactical are your personnel? Can they actually look at this device, you know, not just from a compliance perspective, but an attacker perspective? Right. And, you know, to that point, as you just mentioned with the FCC, um, our red teams and our embedded systems teams here at Silence Love regulatory requirements uh, because most times they were designed around um, physical and, and radio based systems. And so there was not the concept of, you know, the, you know, common components reused across the, the marketplace. And there was not the, well, if I'm putting my entire device design into the FC, FCC database, you know, somebody couldn't go remake this device, as you mentioned before. However, with the amount of commodity parts and the cost of computing going down dramatically, you're not safe just because you made the device yourself. Um, it really takes that, that outside expertise, as you pointed out, to evaluate you know, how hard it would be, you know, just from a paperwork and a tabletop perspective, how, how difficult would it be for an attacker to replicate my system? Um, you know, a, a good embedded systems uh, security expert should be able to take a look at most IoT devices, whether they be uh, a, a medical device or a vehicle or a, a home thermostat and give you a, a, a explanation of the breakdown of the components of that system and help you understand whether or not an attacker could just order these parts off Alibaba or DigiKey or whoever it happens to be and, and recreate a similar system. And that goes back to the point Amy made earlier about your design and, and how it was the concepts behind it. Um, if your backend ecosystem implicitly trusts your hardware design and it's reasonable that a attacker could go buy those and reassemble them themselves, then you have a, you know, a potentially uncontrolled risk um, that needs to be mitigated somehow. Uh, and so really understanding how the design was influenced and what the security concepts were and what the you know, risk that the organization accepted when the device was designed is, is extremely important. And that is, to Amy's point, why it's important to get third-party organizations just to provide a sanity check on, on what your internal team is, is saying. Uh, absolutely. And Rob, should we, should we do the fun stuff, the use, the use cases? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's let's skip over to the next slide if we could. That'd yeah, be great. Yeah, so you know what's what's interesting here is uh, you know I'll let Amy take it from the legal perspective on each one of these first, and then I'll discuss kind of what the you know security implications are, what the design of a lot of the systems we see are, and then um, what kind of standard, if any, we see inside of client organizations that they may or may not be applying. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to be talking about as we walk through use cases very generically some of the breaches that we've encountered and we are going to be sanitizing information to make sure that we, we do not disclose the information of clients. Um, for clinical IoT, um, we are not just seeing IoT attacks where IoT devices are being used as as bandwidth suckers to attack others in denial of service attacks, and like the Mirai botnet. What we are seeing in our data breach practice is EKG machines um, that are exposed to the internet as a public node that are being um, used and exploited by attackers to get onto a hospital network. Telehealth devices where um, databases on the telehealth devices and the devices have both the ability to view and they have storage um, that can be exploited. We are seeing the device themselves as either a breach 
a particular breach vector to get onto a network, um, as well as a vector for specific data off of these devices. And as we were talking about earlier, the trend on IoT devices is for these endpoints, for the data to be far more decentralized and for there to be more processing power and data collection at the endpoint to give your users and your business folks more actionable information. With having that kind of, that cross of more data, more difficult to secure, and that velocity of data, we really want to make sure, especially for clinical IoT devices, where you know, if you've got personal health information subject to HIPAA or subject to appropriate state HIPAA-like laws, we want to make sure that the, the PHI on those devices is appropriately encrypted, is appropriately stored, is appropriately access controlled, that follows all of the different hardened security standards for your regulated devices. I think what is more important though than design security, specifically as we think about, you know, for those of you, we are not designing these devices, you're putting these devices on your network. For the lawyers and compliance people who have oversight over the technologists, it's making sure that those devices sit within your network appropriately, they are limited in access, they do not broadcast IPs, that, that the typical architectural security that you would place over any, any endpoint or computing device, that same analysis has been done over an IoT device, and that device has been appropriately segregated on your network. So we want you to treat you know, clinical IoT devices like you would treat a clinical computing device and be mindful that HIPAA and HIPAA-like state laws apply to that device in the event that it is broadcasting PHI. And let me let um, Rob take a peek at his own practical perspective here. Yeah, and that's, that's uh, you know, HIPAA rules all when it comes to healthcare, right? Because that is the, the, the biggest uh, thing that they're able to point to from a uh, fiscal penalty perspective if they, uh, you know, a monetary penalty perspective if they don't obey. Um, one of the, you know, practical security design issues we see inside of the healthcare space is um, the healthcare device manufacturers are rapidly moving towards um, adapting proactive security postures inside a lot of their organizations, but they're still not to the point where they're adapting things like a, a UL yet, mostly because it's not really required. It hasn't been proven out. There hasn't been a lot of people to go through it. There's still a lot of questions. And so they tend to default to kind of industry best practices. And what you find inside a lot of clinical IoT and especially clinical IoT manufacturers, whether they be large medical device manufacturers, small groups doing high, you know, high speed innovation or somewhere in the middle, is that they do their best to apply industry, you know, industry standards and best practices, but in most cases those are designed around uh, normal computing systems, things that have Windows and Linux on them that you know, have OSs that you can interact with and they, they have firewalls they can be attached to and they communicate in very specific ways. One of the things we've noticed when we go into a lot of organizations, our, our clinical information security practice and our red teams go in to do evaluations of clinical technologies is that even very new medical devices are highly secured or, or very close to, to being highly secured in the sense that they meet corporate security standards on maybe a control interface or a nursing workstation, but the actual surgical robot or the monitoring system or the infusion pump or the MRI or CT is completely exposed because, well, we don't know what to do with that. That's mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, from a, a due diligence perspective, probably not going to fly. Uh, and so what uh, we work in a lot of cases uh, with HDOs, uh, we work with them to understand how the manufacturer designed the computing systems 
how their you know big iron, their MRs, their CTs, their linear accelerators, and even their small portable IoT devices, how they interact with the computing ecosystem, how they're updated, what protections are put in place, you know, what kind of mitigation strategy they need to take, what kind of segmentation strategy. And it becomes, especially in the clinical and HDO side of things, um, it becomes a, a design partnership going forward. The manufacturer did a certain amount of due diligence and work to create a secure device before it was deployed. And now as part of the second part of that partnership, they help inform the HDO to continue to apply reasonable mitigations and policies and procedures um, to help ensure that device is secure while it, while it uh, does patient operations. Yeah, and I, I think very importantly, especially in the healthcare context, you know, quite often the covered entity might indeed be trying to develop use cases for different IoT technologies right along with the manufacturer. So quite often kind of that IP piece and it's almost like a shared appliance that people are trying to innovate over. Um, you know, where you have some of your more um, premier institutions that really are trying to kind of develop um, IP for their own hospital and health systems and who really kind of have input into the design process, delineation of security responsibility is extremely important. Um, because, you know, ultimately, if you don't talk about who has the responsibility to harden the device, um, you know, before it goes onto a network, and who has the responsibility, and how will ongoing patches be done, and what will be that process, in the event that it's not discussed and delineated, either with an export or with your internal staff, um, you know, then in the event that that device creates trouble, it will ultimately be discovered and discussed under duress. And that's just, it's a very difficult, um, you know, it's a very difficult process once you're already in mid-breach investigation to have a vendor admit responsibility for their design failings or their failure to warn. Right, and that's, that's interesting moving to the next use case with industrial control systems because unlike healthcare technology, industrial control systems, especially PLCs and the way they're designed and they manage processes is, is very, very uh, heavily regulated and controlled from a marketplace perspective and so um, you know, how they design technology is, is different than a, a medical device, even though practically speaking, they have similar cyber to kinetic functions. Mm -hmm. um, and you might find with the industrial control systems is, you know, given the age of the system, cybersecurity might not even have been a thought during the time in which the control system has been developed. Um, you know, so at, what, what we have found, you know, is, especially as you're dealing with grid-based technologies, energy providers, you know, they're, the systems that um, have been newly upgraded and newly in place, um, you know, there has been considerable design thought and considerable security thought for the systems that, you know, essentially people were trying to do their best to do remote management, you know, 20 years ago or more. And they were really just looking for a way to quickly and cheaply not have to deploy a person, you know, in a remote area. Security might not have been the, the, the top issue considered. I would um, say most likely it wasn't from our experience. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, it, and to know that, um, you know, for those industrial control systems, you know, many of them are going to be subject to NIST-based standards. Some of them are going to be subject to energy specific standards like the NERC SIP. Um, you know, some of them are going to be, uh, be subject to, um, you know, industry best practices and, and industry protocol for smart devices. So as you're thinking through the specific devices that you're trying to deploy in your network or you're trying to develop an industrial control system yourself, um, really inventorying you know, what 
the data flows and what security laws you're subject to and kind of the analysis that was done on a system at the time that it was put in place and going forward is extremely important. It's, it's a part of what we all do for even non-IoT devices. But to give you a, a real um, a view of industrial control system breaches, we had another client where their manufacturing floor, um, they had, you know, they had devices that helped manufacture components um, that were completely controlled by SCADA-based industrial control systems. Their intellectual property was loaded into their these these computing devices that the that built, um, you know, their their products. Their IP, you know, because these computing devices were exposed and security was not as much of a thought as it should have been at the time that that plant was put together, their IP was essentially in the clear. So um, we want you to not just think about, you know, sector-specific law, state data breach law where PII might be impacted, but also think about what is the value of data that is being transmitted over this device and could it materially impact my company and my continued ability to do business if it's compromised? So that's, that's a, a great point actually, switching that thought to kind of the in-home devices as a last use case because there really are no standards uh, aside from maybe the, the California FTC and FCC um, for how these are designed from a security perspective yet, we bring them onto our homes and connect them to our Wi-Fi and hook them up to our computers and put in all kinds of credentials. And, you know, they, they really don't have a fixed set uh, of, of anything other than what the manufacturer does from a due diligence perspective. And so you could take something like a, a Nest thermostat that was designed by Google that has a, a huge uh, cybersecurity team to evaluate what, the, their products and their subsidiaries make uh, all the way to a device that was ordered off Alibaba that was in the, at the end of a manufacturing run for some other, you know, some other product manufacturer in some other part of the world, and they coexist on your network. Um, they become a interesting potential exposure point um, inside of your own home environment where you don't have the same cybersecurity controls that you do in your corporate environment but you might have a corporate asset inside of your home environment. Uh, and so that, that becomes a very interesting, how the device is designed, what security attributes are applied to it, and what, how you, you trust it when it's inside your home network. Yeah, and, and if we do have any in-home device manufacturers, you know, here we're worried about PII. We're also worried about safety of someone's home. You know, there's real burglary, um, you know, real potential robbery issues um, that may be within someone's home and the ability to see into someone's home. Also, what a number of our device, um, device clients have encountered is there are security researchers out there that um, have seen that devices are uh, attached to a Mirai botnet, attached to other botnets, and they brick them. So, um, you know, as, as you're evaluating, you know, we want to make sure that our device is secure because we want to make sure that we're protecting information. We also want to make sure that your devices are secure because we want to ensure that your clients will be able to continue to use those devices and they won't be bricked by security researchers where they're now unable to be internet accessible. Um, so that, that's also an important component. Yeah, I was just saying, and then you basically lose the entire value proposition of the device. Um, it, this, go ahead. Oh, no, no, by all means, I was saying we should probably wrap up and switch over to our checklist at the end. Yes, that was what I was just going to say. If we could move to the next slide. Um, so practically speaking, I'll just cover it quickly from a technical perspective. These are just a subset of the myriad of requirements we deal with uh, when we we go into an organization and we help them really evaluate the practical reality of their design. Um, how that's influenced, what the business drivers are, what the internal policies are, legal and compliance, just like Amy said, has a huge influence. 
privacy exists in some places, somewhere it doesn't. The hardware and firmware design is also, um, a lot of organizations treat them as two completely different departments, but really they're inextricably linked. Um, you can't treat them as two separate things from a technical perspective uh, because the firmware can mess with the hardware and the hardware can mess with the firmware because the hardware in a lot of times has its own specialized firmware to run things like NIC and memory and a lot of other parts. Um, the operational software itself, the OS, um, the operating system obviously is the part that's most exposed and so the one that gets the heaviest amount of design support, the ecosystem around it, how APIs are designed, whether or not their life cycles designed to support it from a secure engineering perspective. And then lastly, one of the big things we deal with from a technical perspective is sunsetting and eliminating the device from the operational, uh, from your operational cycles. Do you recall it? Do you just in support? Do you tie it off? What does that look like? And that's something that a lot of device manufacturers and sometimes device users don't really consider. So I'll give uh, Amy as, as the guest speaker the, uh, the final thoughts there and we can wrap it up. Sure, and I'm just gonna talk through a few easy things that have caused my clients breaches. So um, when we're talking about embedding um, design-based IoT security, um, are you embedding your design security in your IT project management process? Do your JIRA reports, do your other design um, flow systems actually have workflows for security? Um, we want you to, as if you're designing these devices, develop artifacts of compliance that in the event that you have to show to a regulator, you can show that security was considered. For all of the checklist components, delineating what is your responsibility as an IoT purchaser, as an IoT manufacturer, or as an, a network owner where the device will sit. That delineation of responsibility is extremely important and not always done well. Um, in the event that we've got some big companies on the line um, and you're purchasing a number of devices or you're doing a mass order, that is a delineation of responsibility that you should request and, and, and ensure that you have. Um, then, even if you're not designing the IoT device, do the simple and stupid things. Have your IT folks and your security folks check to see if they can tell net. Can they wide open communicate to an IoT device with either no password or a, you know, under one of the commonly used passwords? Does the IoT device, when you externally scan your network, does it pop on your network? Does it have its own externally indicated IP? Um, you know, just doing a few things like delineation of responsibility, appropriate management of IT project management, and then some of the simple stupid like telnet and vulnerability scanning, those can save you an awful lot of trouble once you are actually, you know, have transitioned you know, from setting up the device to potentially getting in trouble in the context of a breach process before a regulator or before a business partner. And um, we hope in this process that we can save you a little bit of trouble overall. Okay. And thank you everyone for, for staying on the line and being interested in this topic. Yeah, thank you, Rob and Amy, very much for your insights today. And anyone that wants to get in touch with Rob and Amy for follow-up, just reach out to us and we'll put you in touch with them directly. And and that will conclude our webinar today. Thank you.